Hi, this is Dr. Lat Mansour, Research Lead of Health via Modern Nutrition here on HVMN Podcast. This episode, we had the honor to interview the Ben Azadi. In 2008, Ben himself made a major transformation where he lost 80 pounds of fat. Ever since then, he is on a mission to help 1 billion people to live a healthier lifestyle. He's also the host of a podcast called Keto Camp, which won the Keto Podcast of the Year by the Metabolic Health Summit this year. And he's also an author of multiple books, including his latest book, Keto Flex. In this episode, we talked about his book, Keto Flex. We talked about mitohomesis, how ketones help with mitochondrial biogenesis. And we also talked about gratitude or what he calls as vitamin G in transformation and healthier lifestyle. We also covered feast and famine cycles and how does that help with healthier lifestyle. Now, if you are interested, please stay tuned and enjoy this episode. Hi, today we have the Ben Azadi on the HVMN podcast. Hey, Ben, thank you so much for coming on. Lat, I'm excited, man. I love what you're doing. I'm so glad the podcast is back and, and kicking butt and I had you on my podcast. Now it's great to be on yours. Yeah, it's different to be on, on the other side, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> the roles have changed. My the friend. roles, the tables have turned, <laughs> but I'm sure you'll be completely fine. I've seen a lot of your content, a lot of your you know speeches and presentations. Great speaker. So I am I'm very, very excited to um, kick this episode out by asking you to tell a little bit about yourself to our listeners uh, in terms of what your background is and what your passion is and let them know you a little bit more. Absolutely. So like many people out there, I grew up in America following a standard American diet. <laughs> and I, you and I both know it's a very toxic, heavily processed diet. But that was my life growing up. My mom actually worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken, <laughs> fast food restaurants, two of them when I was a kid. So she brought me home Kentucky Fried Chicken pretty much every night. The only nights that my mom did not bring me home Kentucky Fried Chicken was when the oil was being used so much because they, they only replace the oil, by the way, in these fast food restaurants every 14 days, meaning they're frying it over and over and over. And then 14th day, let's replace it with new canola oil, right? So on that you know, 12, 13, 14 day, she wouldn't bring home the, the chicken because she said the oil needs to be recycled. But other than that, I ate a whole bunch of bad food and I was very unhealthy growing up. I was obese physically, obese mentally. I had really bad behaviors, uh, such as my environment and the food I ate. I had addictions to video games and sugar and alcohol and drugs. It was just really, really bad growing up. And it showed with my physical and mental appearance. So when I became an adult, you now uh, I went to college. I ended up dropping out of college because all I wanted to do was play video games and, and drink soda and eat pizza. That was like my life. And I was 23 years old. This was back in 2008 going through a very difficult time in my life where my girlfriend at that time, we were together for over three years. She left me because all I wanted to do was play video games. And she left a big hole in my heart. I was devastated and I was depressed. And I wanted to honestly give up on life. I was looking for ways to actually give up on life. And every time I explored that, I, I, I kept thinking about my mom and the devastation she would have to deal with if I took my life. And it stopped me, thank God, because I think I would have went through with it if I didn't have my mom and my thoughts. And it was a vicious cycle because I was tired of hurting every day. I was 250 pounds at this time, 34% body fat, really unhealthy, 23-year-old young man, but I felt old. And everything changed for me the second that I started to read books. Uh, I, I picked up a book. A friend handed me a book which led to five books and 10 books and 20 books. And I read authors like Tony Robbins and Bob Proctor and Dr. Wayne Dyer and all these incredible authors. And the books opened up a whole new world for me, Lat, but the most important thing that the books did for me was help me, they helped me take ownership and responsibility for the first time ever. Uh, up until that point, my ability to respond to life, which is what responsibility means, my ability to respond to life was poor. I was blaming my genetics. I was blaming my enabling mom, bringing me home Kentucky Fried Chicken. I was blaming my slow metabolism. But when you take ownership and responsibility, all that goes away. So in that second, I said, I am responsible and I immediately stopped being the victim of my history. And in that second, I became the victor of my destiny and everything changed. Nine months later, I lost 80 pounds. I went from 34% body fat to 6% body fat. I went from size 38 waist to size 30, completely transformed my physical health, but also achieved what I call a physical, uh, excuse me, a mental six pack. And 
That was about 14 years ago. Uh, now I've been in the health and nutrition space ever since. Trying to, you and know, the process learn. only took nine months. It took nine months to get through that weight loss, but the weight I, loss, yeah. the weight loss, but I wasn't necessarily healthy at that point. I was one of those fit, sick people. So it took some years to really explore what true health of felt like. Yeah. I mean, metabolism, like chronic diseases and metabolism, it takes a long time. Um, it's a very gradual process where you slowly become sicker and sicker and you don't even know it, as you said, because you're doing stuff that are quote unquote enjoyable that gives you that dopamine, right? Like last episode with uh, Drew Manning, we talked about these hyper palatable food and these short term dopamine rushes that you get with relationship to food, with relationship to video games or anything that is very decadent and very, you know, distracting from the actual work that you have have to put in for living a healthy life. So like, uh, I, I definitely get you because I have been there. I was overweight before. Um, I, I lost all those weight. And it's, it's really interesting here, the point that you pointed out. As soon as you take responsibility of your current situation, everything else, all the blaming games go away and you can actually start taking action. And you can, I think that is the hardest but also the most important step is to write the first word on a blank piece of paper for an essay, right? It's, it's have taking that first step and really pushing forward. So kudos to you, congratulations. Now you're one of the, the biggest names in, in metabolism, health and, and nutrition. You have your own podcast and also authors, uh, author of multiple books. So let's talk a little bit about your upcoming book, uh, your, your new book, Keto Flex. Yeah, thank you, Lat. And I love Drew Manning. Uh, great, great person to interview. He's such a good guy. Keto Flex. So the principle behind Keto Flex, which is my latest book, and I'm really proud of it. It's got some great endorsements. Actually, Drew Manning endorsed the book as well. Um, the, the book is, right. is really about ancient healing. Uh, and when I say ancient healing, I mean these are principles that have – stood the test of time. They've been around for as long as humans have existed. And of course, ketosis, as you're a big fan of, uh, is one of those ancient healing strategies. There's really nothing new about keto. It just might be new to some people or nuanced, but in reality, it's a metabolic process that has been around for as long as humans have existed. And if there was no such thing as ketosis, we actually would not exist today because thank God for ketones, otherwise our ancestors would not have the ability to have any kind of energy in their brain. They would have died. Uh, they wouldn't have been able to focus and hunt, and we would have been we would have been extinct if it wasn't for ketosis. So, the book talks about that. It talks about the history of ketosis and how it's not a fad; it's a fact. And then we get into other ancient healing strategies like fasting and fasting strategies and carnivore. But the principle of keto flex, and the reason I call it that, and the way that I speak and teach keto, very different than most people in the keto space. A lot of people, and, and no disrespect at all, I love everybody in the space, but a lot of people in the keto space will teach to be in ketosis for the rest of your life. And I, I think keto ketosis is a very valuable tool, but I don't think it's the only tool. Our ancestors, they always flexed out of ketosis when they had the opportunity. Yeah, they all did keto, but they flexed out. So that's the principle. The principle is keto flexing, which means metabolic flexibility, metabolic freedom. That's what we want to get to, the ability to burn fat and sugar and go back and forth without a hiccup. And that's what the book's primarily about. Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really amazing point that you pointed out, metabolic flexibility, because that was the entire PhD that I did in, you know, uh, uh, looking at cardiovascular disease and diabetes and how our heart, especially, you know, heart and the brain, where you need to work 24-7, you know, from the day you, you, you're born to the day, you, even before you're born, to the day you die, these organs need to work really hard and constantly, and therefore, it is programmed to be able to use all the fuels, all the different substrates at any given given time, and that is metabolic flexibility, right? Given different stimulus, what sort of substrates could provide these organs with ATP, which is the currency for energy in the cells? So this is a, a great conversation starter. Um, and let's talk a little bit about, you know, what you talk about ancient healing. What, why is ketosis ancient? Because I know, you know, you and I, we know this. We, we, we've been in this area for a while. So for our listeners who are new to ketones, who are new to ketosis, what are the differences between ketosis and ketones and ketoacidosis? Would you like to talk a little bit more on that? Absolutely. Yeah. So I, as I mentioned, they're ancient healing because they've been around forever. Uh, and as a matter of fact, like accidentally, uh, ancient Romans discovered the power of fasting and ketosis 
a long time ago because back then uh, when individuals were having seizures, they didn't know what it was. There was no term for epileptic seizures. So they, they thought these individuals were actually being possessed by demons. And they thought, whoa, these people, they're convulsing. They're, they're, um, you know, they're, their saliva is coming out of their mouth. They're dripping saliva and shaking. They're possessed by the devil. So they would lock them up in a room, no food, no water, come back several hours later, and they'd be fine. They, would, they thought they were like starving the demons out, but they forced them to fast, which produced ketones. And we now know through research in the 1920s that a ketogenic diet is really, works really well for epileptic seizures. So it's simply this. The process of lowering insulin, a.k.a. lowering your carbohydrate intake to lower insulin and glucose as you study and teach lat. So your body can now tap into its body fat, its, its reserves, its, its uh, uh, energy reserves, if you, if you will. And when you do that, you start mobilizing those fatty acids that are in your body fat. Those fatty acids are sent to your liver, that soccer mom organ liver that does everything for us. And the liver starts using that for energy, and then it produces ketones. This is ketogenesis, the birth of ketones. And there's three types of ketones, as you know, Lat. There is beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is tested in the blood. That the unique thing about BHBHB is that it has the ability to cross the blood-brain barrier. There's acetone, which is expelled in the breath. Uh, breath ketone meters are testing for acetone. And then there's acetoacetate, which is expelled in the urine, which is the urine strips. So those are the three types of ketone bodies, and then that's how ketones are produced. You gotta, you gotta take your carbohydrates low enough, or there's other ways. It's not necessarily about high fat. That could be one way, high fat, low carb, but also uh, exercise and intermittent fasting are other ways to do that as well. So there's different avenues to get into ketosis. That's, that's the biochemistry 101 here, guys. Um, so you know when you have high sugar intake, you spike your insulin high because your insulin is essentially a signaling molecule, a hormone that tells the rest of your body to take in this high amount of sugar that is circulating in your blood so that you can use them for, for energy. Now, what happens when you actually don't use them for energy? So you are sitting, you are sedentary lifestyle, but you're still consuming that high sugar. What happens is that it's either going to you know, um, store it as fat and you are like really accumulating fat uh, body fat percentage, or it's gonna, you know, increase the inc uh, the circulating sugar in your blood, which case, uh, in, in which case it will damage um, neurons, it will damage nerve endings, it will damage a lot of systems there because of the constant um, high sugar circulating in your body. So in terms of, you know, you, you talked a little bit about how our bodies can correct ourselves. We can heal ourselves as long as you remove the inter interference, right? So let's talk a bit on what are the different interference and how do you just remove them? Because I know there's multifaceted, multimodal. It's not just one size fits all solution. Like how do you overcome that mental challenge and that relationship with food, for example, and the relationship with, you know, um, activities that make you feel good. How, like, tell us a little bit on like, what, what are the tips that you tell your students? Yeah, great, important question, because a lot of people are dealing with that challenge of like, dopamine hits and food addiction and that that short term gain with uh, results in long term pain and frustration. So I could, I'll share from my experience, and, and this is kind of what I coach my, my Keto Camp Academy students. I've taken thousands of students through, you know, these protocols. And for me, you know, when I had food addiction, when I was looking for the answers in my refrigerator and my pantry, and I wanted that, those dopamine hits, and that happened for years, for me, it was a result of not being clear on my, my highest values. Like, I didn't have any priorities in life. There was no goals. And when you don't have goals, you have holes and you fill the holes with food and dopamine and, and bad behavior. So when I got clear on my highest values, then I looked at those addictions and I look at addiction as like a superpower, uh, which is a very different approach. But I was putting a lot of discipline. I was putting a lot of energy and bandwidth into my addictions. I, I became one of the biggest, the best video game players in the world back then. I actually made it to the final four in Madden football, like the Madden challenge. Final Four, I almost won the whole thing. I uh, was one of the, I was ranked 142 out of millions of Call of Duty players. So I knew that I had a superpower, but I was using it for the wrong thing. So when I got clear on my highest values and it came from being depressed and suicidal, 
health became very important to me, nutrition. So I, I transferred the energy, man. I went from transferring all the energy into video games, into addiction, into all the discipline I was putting there, and I transferred it to what was actually more important to me. And now it's being used as a superpower. So that's the first tip I would say. Like, find out what's important to you. The, Greek, the Greeks call it your telos, your highest value. And then use that energy that you're using on your addiction and transfer it to that highest value, the, the, the new goals that you're setting. Once your why is strong, then the how becomes a lot easier. That would be the step number one for me. Great. Um, that's that's um, amazing tip because... It is so true, like how you pick something that you ha are already doing so well, and then you transfer the energy from something unhealthy to something healthy. So I had something, uh, something similar of an experience, but it's a bit of a reverse. So when I was in my second year in my undergrad, um, you know, I was 22 year old. Uh, I was, you know, um, overweight. I wasn't obese. I was overweight. I was a smoker. So I was very unhealthy. And I started exercising and not because I wanted to lose weight because my housemate sort of asked me to go running with her and I realized how hard it was for me to run. <laughs> I hated physical activity. And I, because of the pride that I had, because I was 22, I was like, this cannot be happening. So I kept doing it and I finally, you know, lost about like 20 kilos, 45 pounds in like four months. But then that was in the cusp of going to my third year. And in my third year is my final year in the UK. It's, it's only three year degree. And I needed to get a first class honors in order to get a scholarship for my master's program. So at that point, I told myself, if I can actually lose weight from physical activity, which I hated all my life, I can actually push myself to get my first class, because I'm like 1.5% away, but that means like a, I have to get 1.5% extra for all my modules across the board. But I told myself, I have been studying all my life. That was what I was good at, and I stayed away from physical activity. So if I can achieve something in physical activity, there stands no reason for me not to be able to achieve something academically. So mm -hmm. I pushed myself, and I pushed myself, and I finally got my first class, and that was how I got into um, Columbia for my master's. Program wow. with a scholarship, so because I couldn't afford it. I mean, I come from a you know developing country, Malaysia. Uh, uh, my family, uh, they are you know middle class. They certainly can't. They can afford probably local university, but they certainly can't afford you know paying USD or, or British pound uh, to support my education. So I was, I'm really grateful and, and really happy uh, you know with the opportunities that were presented to me. That's a so great story. Point. You know, that's an amazing. I didn't know that about you. I didn't even know you smoked. By the way, that's new. Information yeah, I smoked for seven years. I smoked. Wow. Mm, very young, <laughs> 15 to 22. I was not supposed to be smoking, but I did. Um, it was a lot of peer pressure. It was a lot of me being this geeky, nerdy guy that do not have friends and I want to be accepted and I want to blend in and be part of the group, the cool group, and the cool group all smoke. So I feel that that is the rite of passage, that's the rite of entry to get into that group. And, not, and then later I found out that you know, through studying metabolism and all that, that I'm doing the opposite, you know? Now it's cool to be healthy. Now it's cool to be, you know, a, a, a low body fat. It's cool to have, you know, really metabolic, uh, metabolically flexible body. You know, that's, that's the shift that we are facing. And, you know, years ago, we look at smoking. It's like, oh, that guy is so cool right now. You look at people who are smoking, you're like, you pity them and you feel bad for them. Because, for example, like my late dad, he passed away from stroke. And then before that, he had a heart attack and he was a mm. smoker. So I know that genetically as well, like I'm not that well, you know, positioned um, to, to lead an unhealthy lifestyle and not face these risks of, of cardiovascular disease and, and chronic diseases. So I particularly have to be very careful on how I take care of myself. So, you know, like going back to what you said about responsibility, your bodies are your responsibility. Your health is your responsibility. No matter what genetics you're given with, no matter what um, education you're given, no matter what environment you're in, ultimately, you have full control of your body and full control of your lifestyle choices that you can eventually make it better. Mm, well said. You're so right. And your environment is a big reason for your thoughts and your actions. So, you know, you got to clean up your environment. Highly recommend you do an audit on your environment and see who's supporting you and who's not supporting you. But like you said, I believe that being unhealthy is one of the most selfish things you can do because not only 
do you suffer if you get unhealthy, if you are overweight and have low energy levels? That person suffers, but also that person's relation, everybody in that person's life, uh, the relationships, the husband, the wives, how could they get your best version if you're not healthy? How could they get your true authentic self if you're complaining all the time, you're hurting all the time? So it's one of the most selfish things you can do is to be unhealthy. My dad also lat, suffered a massive stroke and he was paralyzed for nine months and he ended up passing away. He suffered, but everybody around him suffered too. When somebody gets sick, it's not just the person who's sick who's suffering. It's everybody around them. So just I always want to keep that in mind. If you treat your health casually, you will end up a casualty. Always remember that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's a lot to do with self-worthiness, but it's also how much do you, do you love yourself so that you can love somebody else? And how much do you love your, the people around you to not put them in such situation because we, you know, all of us have gone through a lot of, you know, I'm sure at some point um, gone through grief, right? We've lost people, we've, we've seen people close to us, people we love um, getting sick. And that is not a good feeling. And it's sometimes, you know, not that fault. But most of the time, if it's lifestyle driven, you can do something about it. And even it, like right now, like we're talking about diabetes, you know, 10 years ago, when I started looking into diabetes and as a as a PhD and, and study um, diabetes and cardiovascular disease, it used to be a disease that once you get diagnosed, that's it. You know, you have to live with medication for the for the rest of your your lives, or you just have to deal with amputation. Eventually, yep. it's just going to get you sooner or later. But that is absolutely untrue, as a lot of organizations and healthcare providers proven these days that you can actually reverse diabetes. They call it diabetes remission. So it may not, you know, be completely like cured because once you go back to the unhealthy lifestyle, it may come back. But for as long as you live a healthy lifestyle and choose the healthy foods, you are able to stay, uh, to really, you know, drive the, the disease away and, and drive those complications away. Because what happens is it's the elevated blood glucose, the circulating blood glucose that is causing all the damage to your nerves, to causing all the, all the you know, um, uh, uh, infestations or causing any, any sort of um, infections. So ultimately, it's you against you, you know? It's you against your own choices. So true. And, and type 2 diabetes, you're right. Even to this day, you know, most conventional doctors and the American Diabetes Association will tell you that it's a progressive chronic disease that we could manage. But I've seen time after time people get off their insulin, their metformin, get their A1C from 8.8 .8 to 5.1. I mean, it can be done. The human body is so adaptable. But uh, if you leave your health in the hands of conventional wisdom, they might lead you toward the direction of more symptom management versus yeah. actually getting to the cause. And there's a time and place, I know you agree with this lab, there's a time and place for conventional medicine. Like, thank God we have conventional medicine. But when it comes to the nu nutrition part, the truth of the matter is that a, a cured patient is a lost customer. And uh, there's a lot of money to be made from people who are on, on medications, going through surgeries. And it doesn't have to be that way. We, we have hope and this podcast, this conversation, the work that you do at HVMN, those are the tools to actually help people harness that innate intelligence within their body so their body could actually get to healing itself. That's a powerful but yet controversial statement, what you just said. A cured patient is a lost customer for these pharmaceutical companies. And it is true. And it's sad that our you know, lives are driven by greed by money by capitalism and all of us yes we all have to earn our keep you know we have to you know pay for our roof and pay for our foods but it doesn't have to be that way we can stand for healthier lifestyle have healthier choices but still you know get money out of it yes it may not have you know 100 percent margin like some pharmaceuticals do but at the end of the day, you're helping people and impacting people in that sort of positive way. Uh, and that's why I have a lot of respect for, for people like yourself to really impact people who need it. Because a lot of people, it's not that they don't want to as well. It comes, into, it comes to um, the lack of knowledge, the lack of access to these information. Because obviously, big corporations, you know, sugar corporations, big pharmaceuticals, they, they have the money to really blast it out in all forms of media, um, not just social media. So... Um, this is why, you know, it's important for us to do our work, at, no matter how big or small it is, you know, podcasts and blogs and articles and books and, and keto camp, for example, like it, we, 
we're doing our parts and and I'm, I'm glad we are yeah, yeah and we live we live in an interesting time because in this day and age lat we have people uh and when i mean people i mean your audience my audience those are who are getting educated on metabolic health they walk into their appointment with their conventional doctor and they actually know more about the metabolism and nutrition than their doctor. Like that's <laughs> the point that we've gotten to. And, it, and it's super cool to see people are taking responsibility or taking their health into their own hands. But just a r- ridiculous example of how I think it's, I, I don't know if it will ever be fixed. I, I pray that it will. I pray that the government guidelines get their, their stuff in order. But I mean, that Tufts University food compass that just came out a few uh, weeks ago, a few months ago, it was a chart, right? And it showed items with green bars are foods that should be encouraged to eat in abundance for you and your family. And then items in yellow should be, um, you know, in moderation. And then items in red, minimize, right? And we look at the items that were in green from Tufts University that they recommend. You see uh, shredded, frosted mini wheats. You see Cheerios. You see these actual general meals and big, big food companies actually listed as foods to eat. Then you go down to the red bars, and what do you see? Red meat eggs cooked in butter. As a matter of fact, eggs cooked in canola oil was higher on the list than eggs cooked in butter. How ridiculous is this? So I always tell people, man, I'm like, good place to start. Go follow what the government is promoting in terms of nutrition and then pay real close attention and do the opposite and you're going to be in the right direction. Yeah. (laughs) As ironic as that sounds, it's true. It's true, all these seed oil, it's amazing how, you know, in our field, we know, like people we follow on social media, we, we know the studies are out, how bad uh, seed oils are. But it's amazing how majority of, of America, they don't know it. Um, and they're still following that guideline. They're like, well, you know, it's, it's fortified with vitamin E, it's fortified with yeah. this and that. And, you know, I'm cooking with this, I'm not cooking with a lot of oil. So, but it's really driving inflammation up. Like from a scientific point of view, seed oils is by far driving, you know, inflammation further uh, compared to, to any other, other, other food and I, categories. And I, I'll, I'll take that a step further because when I interviewed Dr. Kay Shannon, I've interviewed her a few times. She, of course, wrote the book Deep Nutrition, which I have here. She used to be the uh, nutritionist for the Lakers when Kobe Bryant was there. Just a couple of weeks ago, I, was, I brought her on a keto challenge and I said, hey, Dr. Kay Shanahan, She's an MD. Look her up, drkate.com. Brilliant. And I said three scenarios. Scenario number one, somebody smoked cigarettes every day. Scenario number two, somebody ate processed sugar every single day. Scenario, scenario number three, somebody had seed oils, aka vegetable oils, every day. Which scenario will lead to disease faster? And she said, Ben, that's easy. Easy question. It's the seed oils. She said, you smoke cigarettes, it's not good for you. But once you finish the last puff, damage is done. You eat a lot of sugar, it's not good for you, but you could exercise and burn it off. She said seed oil, linoleic acid, that omega-6 PUFA, stays in your body fat for two to five years. And it damages your mitochondria, creates massive amounts of disease and inflammation and toxicity within your cells for years. And I agree with her. Uh, out of those three options, I think the seed oils are the worst option there. Well, since you mentioned mitochondria, do you, do you so, you know, we all know ketones are, are very beneficial to mitochondria. Is that, you know, So from that conversation, I'm just curious from a scientific mind here, is there a way at all to clean that, you know, to a certain way or mitigate that effect or that negative impact that seed oil has on the mitochondria by being on a ketogenic diet or by uh, by having ketones in the body? Do you know? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, There there are. There's nothing really concrete, but I'm just going to theorize here what I think would help. Um, we know that when you're in ketosis, ketones are also signaling molecules that communicate with the mitochondria to make more mitochondria. It's kind of like a survival mechanism to create mitogenesis. That's why there's about um, 400% more ATP from somebody in ketosis versus somebody just burning straight up glucose and sugar. So you do get a, the benefit of new mitochondria, which help with the energy production. At the same time, you have the mitochondrial uncoupling to help lower free radicals. So more energy, less free radicals, win-win. Now, what happens when you have all these seed oils? And there's a great study. I have it in my, one of my PowerPoint slides that I can send to you if you want to put in the show notes that, that looked at the mitochondria and they fed the mitochondria different fats, so polyunsaturated fats, monounsaturated fats, and saturated fats, and then trans fats. And they wanted to see what kind of energy production um, and, and uh, free radicals were produced after each fat. 
And of course, the saturated fat, monounsaturated fat performed really well. And then the PUFAs and the trans fats performed really poorly. But it was cool to kind of see how different fats affected the mitochondria. I think, and I, I, I want to, you know, find some concrete research on this. So this is just me hypothesizing what we can do to get the seed oils out faster or potentially protect the, the mitochondria membrane from the seed oils. Astaxanthin um, has been shown to be a very powerful mitochondrial membrane barrier. Um, there's some studies, uh, at least seven of them that I have in my notes here that show what astaxanthin does to kind of act like a bodyguard to protect that mitochondrial membrane, to not allow too many bad things in uh, and allow good things in and make it very fluid in the right way. Uh, and then vitamin E as well. I've, been, I've seen some research on what vitamin D, uh, vitamin E, excuse me, can do for the mitochondrial membrane. Uh, and of course, uh, and I want to hear your thoughts on this. To my knowledge, there's only two antioxidants that could get into the mitochondrial membrane. One of them is glutathione and the other one is melatonin. So I would throw those into the mix unless there's something else that I'm missing. So that would be my thought process on it. But what are your thoughts, Lat? Yeah. Um, so where the question came about is that I'm just thinking, okay, we metabolize all these substrates and seed oil is considered a substrate, right? It's a fat, right? So it, it, that's why I was more curious as to why she says it will you sort of stay in the body between two to five years and what form would that molecule be in while being, you know, while staying in, in the body, if you know what I mean? Because she, she if says, it's in a form of fatty acid, then we should be able to metabolize it. But then if it's converted into a form that is constantly increasing inflammation, but not being recognized as a metabolite, then it will be a different story. Yeah. So that's a good question. Um, and you should bring her on to ask that question directly. But here's what I think she would say. I think she would say that the linoleic acid is being embedded into the, mito the not just the mitochondria membrane, but the, also the cell membrane. And it's, and it's uh, you know, it's a, for lack of a better word, it's gunking up the receptor sites, the membranes, and that's uh, staying there. Half-life, she predicts, that is two years, meaning if you remove vegetable oils today, in two years, the, the linoleic acid, the omega-6, will still be around the membranes of your cells after two years. Half of it will be around after two years. So she's brain. theorizing that these um, seed oils, these fatty acids are being incorporated into the phospholipid bilayer, which makes up the membrane of the cell. And, and that makes sense because, you know, our cells, if there's something bad and then our body will recognize it as, you know, invader and, and in, increase inflammation and increase sort of response to battle that. And if they can't get rid of that, they will just upregulate. Our, our body is made to just constantly upregulate inflammation if they can't get rid of it because you know our body is not that fine-tuned where it will find other mechanism it is very smart in a lot of ways but there are some times where you know our body would just like okay there's a lot of glucose let's crank up insulin oh there's more glucose let's crank more until the pancreatic beta cells sort of fail and and can't compensate that um demand of insulin yeah and so one, more, that, one more thing yeah. to that because this i love this conversation it's so interesting i know this that the, the body, the number one priority for the body is survival. The, the, the body mm -hmm. just wants to survive. It'll do anything, everything short-term to survive, even if that means long-term disease is developing. So toxins, for example, like heavy metals, environmental toxins. When toxins enter the body via eating it through our food, glyphosate, whatever it is, or silver fillings in your mouth or touching your skin, the innate intelligence doesn't want those toxins to go right into your, your brain or your organs. It wants to preserve that. So it activates PPARY pathway, which actually shuttles those toxins to your body fat because the solution to pollution is dilution. So with that, I would think it's the same thing with seed oils. It's a toxin. It's an it's a unstable fat. I think I would hypothesize. We've got to find out for sure. I would think the same process or a similar process is happening. It's increasing the fat cells to kind of dilute the toxicity of what's entering the body. Yeah, um, that's that's a, a logical explanation for sure. I mean, hey, you know, listeners out there who are scientists, please make you know make sure you go into that sort of research and and find the re find the you know answer out for us. We'd love to have you guys on on the podcast yes, and talk about this, please. Um, yeah, and 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 you talked a bit, uh, you know, I want to dial back a little bit on the antioxidants as well, glutathione and uh, melatonin, yeah. and. What I have found is that ketones, so Dr. Gundry talks about this, that ketones increase uncoupling. So in a way, uncoupling is not recommended because uncoupling in the mitochondria means wastage of energy because 
the, the electrons are not being coupled and, and not perfectly you know, synergized with the ATP generation. However, and we know that ketones does increase in coupling. However, um, what some research actually points out is that that uncoupling caused by ketone is not high level enough to really cause a significant wastage of energy, but instead a little bit of um, uncoupling causes mitohormesis. And mitohormesis means um, the mitochondria is adapting to that quote unquote, you know, bad um, event, which is the uncoupling. But then as a result, it generates more antioxidant in order to battle the oxidative damage right. from the uncoupling. So as we all know, you know, inflammation is not necessarily bad because it is a mechanism at which our body uses to combat infection and combat uh, toxins. But at the same time, constant elevation of inflammation, like in chronic diseases, it shows that it is bad because it starts damaging all the cells and organs around you. It's the same thing here. Constant uncoupling and high level of uncoupling is definitely not good because you are not using the energy efficiently. But the uncoupling caused by ketones, which are temporary and not that high level, gives the chance for the mitochondria to really adapt to the response uh, or, or adapt uh, uh, um, cultivate adaptive response to the uncoupling, hence creating more antioxidant. And that could also be why people say ketones are anti-inflammatory and anti antioxidative Well explained. I completely agree. That's why you see studies that show when somebody gets into ketosis, there's an upregulation of glutathione to deal with the extra inflammation. But that's a good thing. It's hormesis. What doesn't kill you makes you stronger. But you just made the case, my friend. I don't know if you knew it or not. You just made a case, Lat, that long-term ketosis, meaning uncoupling for too long, could be problematic. And that's one of many reasons why I don't believe in long-term ketosis because, like you said, it's good to have a little bit of some stress and a little bit of uncoupling, but chronic uncoupling and chronic low levels of insulin, that could also be a problem. So my shirt says mitochondrial or mighty mitochondria, and it has mitochondria lifting weights, right? So mitochondria are the name of the game, and you could get – a really cool benefit with cyclical ketosis. And I, and I know Gundry believes in that as well. Yeah, and, and this is amazing because you mentioned what I wanted to talk next, which is what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? Um, so cyclical keto was one of them. Um, we talked about that with uh, Drew Manning in the last episode. Um, I also want to touch a little bit upon fast and, uh, uh, sorry, feast and fasting sort of cycle. Um, that you talk about and, and, and you you know keto camp talks about can you can you explain to our, our listeners what does that mean like fasting famine cycles and how does that play into cyclical ketosis and you know battling um, all these therapeutic diseases yeah I love fasting I know that you're a big fan of fasting too and we're genetically hardwired to practice periods of, of famine aka fasting and then periods of feasting. That's the way that it's been done for a very long time. When our ancestors didn't have food, they were forced to fast. And then they found food and they feasted. And then they ate as much as possible to store as much body fat because they never knew when their next meal was coming. So insulin in that case is, is a blessing. Thank God for insulin because they were able to put on as much fat as possible. Now the famine never comes in 2022 and 2023 and we're just like constantly in a fed state. And that's the problem. But we forget about the fasted state. So the average American, here's something interesting. I have a colleague of mine. His name, is Doc, his name is Dr. Don Klum. He's a chiropractor. He did a patient population survey. So it's not the most you know, efficient study, but it was a patient population survey. He asked hundreds of his patients to write down uh, and, and notate every time they ate something. And we classified eating something as any time they started the digestive process and raised glucose and insulin, meaning it could be a meal or it could be a snack. It could be kombucha, it could be carrots, or it could be an actual burger, whatever it is. And the average American in his study was eating 17 to 23 times per day. They're in a constant fed state, eating for almost every waking hour. I think Sachin Panda has some research on that too. And that's a problem. Uh, we never allow our digestive system to take a break and reset. We're constantly raising glucose and insulin. This leads to insulin resistance, which leads to type 2 diabetes, which leads to heart disease. And it's just growth, growth, growth. And that can mean cancer growth. So fasting is very important because we're overly fed and we're eating too frequently. I, I believe that fasting is kind of like nature's reset button. 
Um, if you're struggling with acid reflux and bloating, uh, gas, indigestion, a 24-hour fast once a week could really repair a lot of those issues. I mean, as a matter of fact, MIT showed 24-hour water fast created new intestinal stem cells in mice. And then you could do a little bit different variation. So I love fasting, not just because it helps you lose weight and lower insulin, but what it does for the brain to help you produce uh, BDNF, which is this brain-derived neurotropic factor, because your body, the innate intelligence, again, survival, you're going through a, a fast, your body thinks you're going through a famine, it doesn't know about Uber Eats or DoorDash, automatically goes into this process, so it raises counter-regulatory hormones, which is the sympathetic tone goes up, it pumps your brain full of BDNF, why? Because it thinks you need to go out there and hunt and kill, but you're going to use that to crush your podcast, to crush an interview, to crush your day. So it gives you all this energy. It's, I love it for many, many reasons. Those are just a few. And this is, this is also another example of, you know, what actually works is the change. Um, you know, whenever we have a change, same thing with from a cellular level, when you're talking about mitochondria, there's an uncoupling, there's a change. So mitochondria respond to it by creating more antioxidant. Same thing here with our lives, right? If we change what our quote unquote, you know, status quo is, if we are used to eating a lot, have a fast, and that change causes our body, it definitely increases the stress that our body is facing. But that stress is actually what you need in order for your body to um, create all these other pathways uh, or upregulate all these downward cascade of pathways to then you know, make it more useful for you or make it healthier for you. For example, you, know, you change some from going from paleo to keto or from keto to cyclical keto. And when you introduce different substrates to your microbiome, that change in and of itself creates that stress signaling. And then that stress signaling is, you know, upregulating all these other uh, enzymes to make sure that you are, you know, um, either losing weight or you are increasing energy. And, you know, it's not, you know, not for everyone, obviously. Like there are some some diets which do not work for some people, and you know, people who cannot be on ketogenic diet because of their dysfunction in in fatty acid oxidation. They're not a lot of them, but there are some non-responders. So, but ultimately, I think always know your body well and change, make those changes every now and again. Because same thing with working out, right? Once you work out on the same routine for three months, six months you ought to change it because your body is well adapted to it and therefore you're very efficient. You know, like you said, our body is always, you know, gunning for survivability, but it's also very smart at learning. So we're the ultimate AI machine, essentially. We are adapting. We are the best adaptive machine. That's what uh, Drew Manning call it. And once your body adapts to the, new, the, the old workout, you need to change it. Either, you know, increase intensity, um, lower, lower the, the weight and, and increase the reps or increase the, 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 the weights and have a progressive load. Something in order to stimulate your muscles uh, to grow. So that is exactly what um, Benek explained. That's it, Lat. You said it. All the great personal trainers know that. That's why they're so successful. They always change up the workout routine. That's why P90X was so successful. That's why CrossFit is so successful. It's the muscle confusion. It's the hormesis. When you, when you force your cells to adapt and you force the mitochondria to adapt, good cells and good mitochondria get stronger, and the bad cells and the bad mitochondria, they don't survive. The body gets rid of them. It's like survival of the fittest. So with that being said, fasting is a stress, like exercise is a stress to the body. So you got to use it the right way. Too much of that stress, then you have that hormetic curve that drops, right? You don't want that. You want to stay in that hormetic zone. So you don't want to be in the familiar zone where you're just, uh, your body has learned everything you're doing and you stop adapting. You want to be in that hormetic zone and you want to continue to get results. And it's so unique and it's hard for me to tell you, well, just do a 16-8 every day or just do keto for two weeks. It's so unique to the person. But we have cool tools like Aura Ring, Whoop Band, CGMs, and things we can do to kind of fine-tune our approach, which is exciting. Yeah, thank you very much for, for that. Like, um, I always think about it um, in my own life as well. You know, like, if I want to grow as a person, I want to grow as a scientist, if I want to grow as a professional, I always almost have to put myself in an uncomfortable position where I'm being challenged, where I'm being asked questions that I can't answer, and therefore I'm going out there and search for the answers. And you know, even when I was doing research, what are the research questions that people don't know and want to know? And that's where you push yourself 
into that uncomfortable situation, out of your comfort zone, and only then you grow because you're learning new things. You are, um, you know, experiencing new things, and that's how you know we grow as as people, as a population, even. So um, I know that you know biochemistry is super important. Obviously, like we have covered a lot on the biochemistry, on the disease progression, on the different mechanisms that are causing all the chronic diseases that are plaguing our society today. But what I am also propagating, what I'm also advocating on HVMN podcast is that you need to know your biomarkers and everything, but that is not an all be all because most importantly, mindset, um, your, your relationship with food, your emotional state is also as important, right? So I know Ben calls it vitamin G, which is gratitude. Um, why don't you share with our listeners why do you think the vitamin G is is important and how it plays a role in in you know the transformation towards healthy lives? Yeah, great topic. I, I love to talk about this. And for for you science nerds, I'll give you the science behind it. So don't just think we're getting woo woo here. It's maybe a little woo woo, but then we'll get into the science. You know, it's a universal law. Lat, uh, what you feed energy to expands. There's no arguing universal law. Like, gravity is the universal law. You might say, I don't believe in gravity. I think gravity is a whole bunch of BS. Well, I mean, somebody jumps off a building, even if they don't believe in gravity, they're going to see that gravity exists. Universal law. Same thing with gratitude. What you feed energy to expands, meaning what you appreciate, appreciates. And there's science to back this up. If you think about Dr. Joe Dispenza, he has a lot of research on vitamin G, gratitude, the strongest, most important vitamin in the world. He's looked at brain scans on people taking vitamin G, meaning they practice gratitude, and he saw 1,200 chemical reactions take place in a matter of seconds when they were practicing gratitude. He saw serotonin, dopamine, GABA. He saw oxytocin and a whole bunch of other feel-good hormones and chemicals being flooded in the body when they are practicing gratitude. It's this anti-inflammatory state. But the science behind it is this. There's a part of the brain called the reticular activation system. It's kind of the size of my pinky. You know all about this lat. And the reason it's there is because it's going to help your brain filter out all the stimulation. If you think about all the stimulation that happens on a day-to-day -day basis, we have lights, TV, screens, cars, vehicles, sound, millions of different things. If we didn't have a process to filter that out, we would burn out the brain, right? So thank God for the RAS because it filters out the things that we need to see that are important to us, again, for what? Survival. So it's going to show you what you've been feeding. For example, let's say somebody listening to the show wants to buy a uh, red Tesla, and they start to put their energy and bandwidth on researching a red Tesla. They go on the internet, they look for used, new, lease, what are the best options? They spend a few weeks researching this red Tesla, and they finally make the decision to drive to the dealership, and they purchase a beautiful red Tesla, and they're driving home in their Tesla. And all of a sudden, they see a red Tesla dart past them on the highway. And they thought, whoa, that's a, what a coincidence. I just bought a red Tesla. That person has one. And for weeks, they see red Teslas pretty much every single day at stop signs, red lights, parking lots. And they start to think, damn, did everybody buy a red Tesla because I bought a red Tesla? No, the red Teslas were always there, but they activated RAS to see it now. Right? So when you practice gratitude and you start focusing on what you appreciate, all of a sudden, things that you used to perceive as obstacles become opportunities. When you appreciate things and you're grateful, you get more things to be grateful for. But the opposite is true. When you start to think about all the things that are not working for you, all the things you hate about yourself, about your health, you're resentful, you get more of that because that's all your RAS is going to see. So I encourage you to develop some sort of gratitude practice. The way that I do it is I write down 10 things I'm grateful for before bed when the subconscious mind is, is more impressionable. And then I do it in the morning. And then sometimes I'll just grab my pad and just write down 100 things that I'm grateful for. There's always something to be grateful for. And I highly encourage your audience to get their, their daily dose of vitamin G. You can't overdose on it. There you go. There you go. Uh, actual pharmaceutical, you can't overdose on it. There's no side effects either. No you know, all that disclaimer at the end is like this adverse effects. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, so this goes back to what we talked about, you know, responsibility, right? Taking responsibility of your health doesn't mean that you have to hate yourself. It doesn't mean that you have to hate your current self because you're not healthy, because you're overweight, because you're living this lifestyle. But 
taking responsibility in a way that is more gratifying, that is more gratitude based, where you are loving yourself because you're still able to make the change. You are, you know, gratitude that you can still have a body. All right, if it's unhealthy, but you can still move, you can still make that change, you can still, you know, go for a brisk walk and you can still eat you know, a, a, a healthy food because you can still make that choice. And I think that mindset is super important for people to not hate themselves too skinny. Mm, so true. And, you know, if, if some people have trouble with this. They have trouble finding things to be grateful for. So my tip to them would be to think of what would happen if something is taken away from you. Like um, the food you eat. You just gave a good example. Like you, you might think, yeah, I'm grateful for this food, but think about what would happen if you didn't have any food, right? You'd be starving. So think about the opposite, and then that will help you become grateful for that um, food, person, relationship, whatever it is. So think about that being taken away, and that should get you in a, in a mindset of gravity, of gra- gratitude, not gravity. <laughs> so – you know, I know you've you've had your personal experience on you know transformation in terms of physical uh, and mindset. Like, did you? You know, this is a little bit about you. Uh, I want our audience to to know about your experience. Did you go through that that transformation simultaneously? I.e., you going through the physical and the mindset change at the same time, or did you figure out the mindset later on? Because I find that in our society, we are so bogged down on physicality we are so bogged down on superficial aspect of things that mm. we sometimes only develop um the mindset later on in life and and that is true for me i for the longest time even after i've lost all those weight the mindset of you know gratitude and worthiness didn't come until in the past year and i've lived oh, wow. you know 37 of my life and and that came quite late but i'm grateful that it came uh, eventually but i think a lot of people got that uncoupled because like you said, it's like one is science and the other is sort of like woo woo. It's like, you know, meditation or it's ancient practice, but it's an ancient practice for a reason, right? Because people know that it works and that's why for the longest time it sort of stayed throughout civilization. So yeah, tell us a little bit more about your, your experience and how can, you know, people out there when they're going through such physical transformation, how can they incorporate that? Yeah, I didn't know that about you. I didn't know that it came in the last year or so. So that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for me, it, it came the, at the same time. I started to read books and then I started to move my body and eat better. So it was simultaneous. But it wasn't until I really became like uh, obsessed with mindset, maybe three years after my, my weight loss transformation. Although I was doing some pieces of it, it wasn't until years after that that I really started to become obsessed with it. But my, I mean, I think this, I believe this to be true. 95% of success is mindset, 5% strategy, right? And if that's the case, I would start with the mindset. I would start with the thoughts. I would start with the gratitude. And as you change that and rewire the brain, then you'll start to make better decisions. You'll start to cut people out of your life who are toxic and put and attract people in your life who are more beneficial to you. And it makes things a lot easier. So that would be the ideal way. I would start with the mindset and then I would add everything else in piece by piece because the mindset is foundational just like sleep. Yeah, that's a great advice because what I have um, gone through, so when I first went through that physical transformation, it was the mindset was, I want more. I want to be better. I want to be faster. I want to be fitter. I want six pack. So it's less so the gratitude and deep down, I I didn't address that self unworthiness Mm. at that time. I sort of put it aside. I'm like, if I chase for more, I will be worthy. Worthy, So I don't have to think about this unworthiness. Mm. But only in the past year that I realized deep down it still exists and it has been, you know, fasted, festering. And I needed to address it. I need to tell myself that I'm worthy as a person, as Lat Manso, and not as a scientist and not as a fit person or a not fit person. Stop associating your being, like just you being you with anything else external. You can do that after you are, you know, you already appreciate and value yourself. And then you you say, oh, on top of that, I'm this and this and this and this, and I can do this, 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 and this. So that was my my big lesson in the past year. Oh, that's a big, beautiful lesson. Uh, and you are worthy, my friend. Amen. You are. Everybody is, thank honestly. You. And uh, I love I love that awareness. And I love that you shared that. So thank you. Yeah, so um, just want to cover one last thing because you mentioned sleep. <laughs> yes. So tell us more how sleep plays a role in all of this. 
I mean, it's foundation. You know that. Um, if your sleep is not optimal, you could be doing all the mitochondrial uncoupling and hormesis you want, and you're not going to get the results that you want. Your body goes into this amazing process. A lot of processes happen during sleep. I mean, you have this this glymphatic system that becomes activated. It's kind of like dishwasher fluid for your brain. You have the cerebral spinal fluid flushing over the brain. The brain is literally shrinking so the fluids could collect these plaques and toxins and flush it out. Very important for preventing uh, brain diseases like Alzheimer's, dementia, etc. And then you also have your body activating fat-burning hormones and burning fat. You have the liver dumping bile. It's called um, uh, liver time in Chinese medicine, 2 to 4 a.m., dumping bile and recycling and cleaning the bile, detoxifying. It's so important. And, and studies show that just seven days – there's a study that I have on PubMed here – seven days of, of uh, lack of, of quality sleep, meaning not less than seven hours of sleep – the blood sugars of healthy adult men were those of somebody who were pre-diabetic, just from lack of sleep after seven days. So you're going to have higher levels of cortisol when you are sleep deprived, and we know glucose follows cortisol. But also, you're going to have higher levels of the hunger hormone ghrelin, so you're hungrier, lower levels of the satiety hormone and fat burning hormone leptin, so you eat pretty much unhealthy because you're craving sugar. You're less satisfied when you eat, so you eat more sugar, and then it's a vicious cycle. So it needs to be uh, one of the staples for you. Uh, instead of counting calories, I know it's a big controversial topic, calories matter. They're not important. Sleep is way more important than cutting calories, okay? So work on sleep. Work on mindset. Work on whole food. Forget about the calorie counting and get those fundamentals straight. Build that foundation strong, and then everything else you add to it will be that much more efficient. There you go. That was very nicely put. And, you know, guys, even though you're very motivated and inspired at this point, you know, of the, of the podcast, of all these stories, and you want to really make a change in your life, make sure that you also stop and relax and make sure you sleep. Mm. Because ultimately, you can be as hungry, as ambitious as, as possible, but your body needs that rest as well so consistency is key is going through that cycle it's like okay i'm going to wake up i'm going to be aggressive uh, I'm, I'm going to practice gratitude and i'm going to eat healthy and i'm going to go work out and then at night i'm going to you know have a good night's sleep i'm going to you know making making sure that uh, i'm going to make sure that all the interference that will um disrupt my sleep cycle or disrupt my quality of sleep to be out of the way so that I can have a good night's sleep. So that's definitely a very, very good um, advice. And speaking of leptin, by the way, which is you know one of the hunger hormone leptin and ghrelin, um, there is a paper that showed um, in animals, r 13 butane diol, which is what ketone IQ is made of, actually increase um, leptin sensitivity mm. in the brain. Yeah. That's interesting. So, so yeah, so on top of exogenous ketones having um, effect on ghrelin, which you know suppresses appetite, it also has increased um, sensitivity uh, to leptin as well. So, so a lot more research in this area. I'm so excited. Yeah, that's exciting because as you know, leptin resistance is it's a big epidemic like insulin resistance. And if you could do things like that to kind of give them a gateway to nutritional changes, that's huge. It's exciting. Yeah. So one last question before we wrap up this episode of, of HBMN Podcast is what is health and modern nutrition uh, to you personally? It's, to me, it, it, it's perfect health, meaning the body was built to heal itself. It was built to thrive, not to survive. So health via modern nutrition means you're doing the work to identify the interference. You're constantly aware of the interference and you're constantly working on removing the interference and you're allowing your body to heal and self-cleanse itself every single day. You're using biohacks such as exogenous ketones from HVMN, my favorite. You're using biohacking devices. You're focusing on fundamentals. But health via modern nutrition simply means to me you're removing the interference and allowing your incredible human body to heal itself. Amazing. If there's anything I can take away from this episode is that we're not taking external sources to fix our bodies, but instead we're removing interference to let our bodies fix themselves. Mm. And I think that is a very powerful piece of information that most people need to know that you are not broken. You are just having all these interference that stops your body from fixing itself. 
So instead of looking for, you know, sources, looking for pharmaceuticals, looking for drugs that can actually fix your problem, there is no one pill that this magic pill that fits, you know, that sorts all of us out. But your body is the magic pill, so to say. Mm -hmm. But you just have to allow it to, does, to, to, to you know, make magic happen <laughs> yeah beautiful well you're 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 i love that great takeaway and and i couldn't have said it better myself because if you're dealing with the symptom or if you have been diagnosed with this disease i got a different perspective i, I think that's a gift to you uh it's your innate intelligence telling you your body telling you that you're out of homeostasis there's interference i'm showing you this check engine light to open up the hood and figure out what's going on not to just take medication and mask it but I'm showing you these symptoms. You're diagnosed with the disease for a reason. This is my gift to you. This is the body's gift to you to find out what that reason is. And that's where we'll leave it. And with that, I would like to offer our platform to you, Ben, um, to let our listeners know where can they find you, where can they find Keto Flex, the book, um, what, what can they expect out of Keto Camp and, and all of that information. So please go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Lat. It's been a big honor. Love HVMN. Uh, love what you do, Lat, and Michael and Jeffrey, your whole team. So thank you for the uh, you know bringing me on your podcast. It's been a huge honor. Uh, I, I just love it. Uh, well, my Keto Camp podcast um, is a great transition since you're listening to the HVMN podcast. Camp is spelled with the K. Just type in Keto Camp podcast. It's available on all podcast platforms. The video formats are available on our YouTube channel. Uh, we had Lat earlier this year. We had Michael. Uh, Jeffrey a few years ago, so you could start with those episodes. And then my website has everything. Uh, it's benazadi.com. You'll see the social media, the books, and all that. But um, yeah, uh, thank you so much for the awesome interview. Love what you guys are doing. Love the ketone IQ shots that I take all the time. Just appreciate your work, dude. Same here, same here. Appreciate it. Let's, let's change the world for, for a healthier world. If you have enjoyed the episode, please like, share, and subscribe. And if you have any comments or feedback, please leave it in the comment section. You can find us at HVMN on all social media platform and myself at Lat Manso on all social media platform as well. The HVMN podcast and myself are powered by Ketone IQ, the most effective way for you to elevate your blood ketone levels for optimal cognitive and physical performance as well as metabolic health. Thanks again for listening. Until next time.